でぽろ。エコナティティロアトゥアイオーラマテエアクエノアイファカリア Ete atua, eti ori ne dam manu, efiti ne pera, erane te tanana, e korori korori ne te te tanana, e hihi o ne te wairo. O awu e roto ki amatau te fakaro adui, me te fakaro an pa, ki amuran ae te kahia, 
Otomu Wairau Tapu Kiarite Hihi Otera Maori Ora E te Karati Te Kuraha Utu Otomato Kuriti Waka Amene Ete whanau kua tae mai nei, haere mai nua mai, whakatau mai ra. Te mai tautahi ki te atua kaharawa, te kaihomai o nga mai katoa, te mia tuarua ki a tato katoa, ki te nei huihunga te kaupapa taha Maori. No reira piki mai, kake mai, tēnā tato katoa. Mihi ka eke ki a koto, tato puki e nohu pai ana, kai wai nganui te mahanatanga ot e o tato fana huri noa, me mihi puki ki a tato, e mahi ana he taiaki na to oga tuku iho, he oranga mo na uri whakatapu, me huki mahara ki na tinu atua. Rato kua here, kaiti tini, kaiti mano, naudiera, here, here atua ra, rato kia rato, tato kia tato. Heonana. E te atua to mato kaihanga, ka tia ho te maramatanga mete ora, i au kupu korero. Ka te mata o mahi, ka mau te tika me te aroa, me a tia ki a u tonu ki a mato, tau aroa i roto i tenei huiunga, whakaki a mata, whakaro a mata mahi katoa. E tau, wairua tapu. Amine. Amine. Tēnā koutou katoa, nau mai hoki mai. Kia koutou, kia tātou, i tēnei ata. Welcome back to our final uh, session in this season, anyway. And uh, thank you for joining us again. And of course, we have our special guest. Uh, just a reminder, of course, the disclaimer, the usual one, I'm not a real teacher or a translator, and I don't have any distinguished academic qualifications to do this but I bring with me my heart and my passion 
to encourage and enable you to engage with Te Reo Māori, with Taha Māori, Te Ao Māori, and the liturgies in the prayer book. As you're already aware, any back translations that we've used in the past, which Piho Pahori provided to us, are used in these liturgies. And of course, they are purely so that you could understand the kupu with a Māori lens from those wonderful translators all those years ago. They are not for public use. Just a quick recap. Uh, what did we cover in this season? We've done mihi, short and formal, and thank you very much for delivering that this morning. Wow, ka mo te wehi. Wonderful. I'm sure you'll be able to pat yourself on the back. It's not about me patting you on the back. It's about you patting yourself on the back to say mahi te kāna. Good work. Good job. We've done karakia timatanga, karakia whakamutunga. Uh, we did that in the first series as well. Hey, mō koe mato, you know that one now. E tu whera ana ngā ngā kato. Stock standard karakia. To start and to finish in any setting, be it church, formal meetings, or even small gatherings. We've had various ways in which to practice our vows and our combination of vows. And I heard that this morning in, your, in the karakia and the mihi, you're really thinking about how those vows are connected, not just a vow on its own, that each vow has its own mana and you're giving it that mana. And I congratulate you. And um, you can only get better with your pronunciation by continuing to practice them. Uh, we looked at the Rawari from the 1905 Book of Common Prayer, that translation, which is available to you online. Uh, we looked at the Rawari. We've also looked at the uh, hymnal, the Rawari hymnal. I'll come to that in a second. We've done some himene and uh, waiata, um, and we've learned a few. We've got many more to learn. So we've got a whole year to learn more. And, and we've also covered in the season Matariki, uh, Maramataka, the lunar calendar. And this morning I am going to ask you again to randomly pick one of those moons and just say it out loud to us. Uh, just a quick recap on Ihumata. <laughs> Toru fa a hakama na para tawa nga fa heke me ni pere te wenge fe i hiki me ni piri te wenge fe o hoko mo no koro to wonga fo a e i o u u huku mu nu puru tu wonga fu. Mangere tapu wai o ne hunga aurere O tahu hu papa toi toi I hu matonga iwi tamaki makaura We picked up some of the himini from out of the Rawari and uh, we talked about ma te mari and how uh, all those years ago in the translation, they still stand today in the um, prayer book. Many, many of these things in the prayer book and also in the um, uh, Piopatanga o Aotearoa hymnal. Still the same numbers even, which is why I chose this one in particular. Māte Marie is has always been hymn number 171. 
pointing out, of course, that in those translations, we maintain the blessing at the top, Māte Marie Ate Atua, still in our prayer book today. Kia tau, kia tātou kato, or kia koutou kato in this case, still on page 52 in our prayer book today, in which will conclude our session once more. Matariki, illuminating our A E I O U, uh, the Māori New Year, time for renewal and celebration. We talked about reflection, reset, and looking ahead, reflecting on the past, being present in the moment, and planning for the future. So, at any time, anyone may say some of the um, marama. Just unmute yes. yourselves. Yep. Good on. Tiria. Oata. Oenuku. Oenuku. Akora. Tamatia Nana. Tamatia Kayariki. Una. Mauri. 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 Uike. Uike. Kari. Te fifi. Fifi. Fifia. Kore kore te rauia. Kore kore te hanu. Tangaroa a mua. Tangaroa a roto. We've covered the uh, tangi. Pangihana and pastoral liturgies in this season. We um, covered all the liturgies in the prayer book surrounding funerals, Tangi Tangihana, and went through each um, section. We've covered Te Tikanga Mo Te Takahi Whare, blessing the house after the Tangi, uh, and all the liturgies related to that. Uh, we covered uh, Te Hura Kohatu. Uh, the unveiling or the memorial uh, on page 881 and all the liturgies uh, associated with that delivery of ministry. Uh, this particular waiata, I won't make you suffer with me singing it again this week, um, <laughs> but I have, I have actually uh, recorded it as I promised, and it'll be made available to you. It's been recorded in, uh, with my ukulele, and it's just much nicer to listen to. Um, but the music is there, so yeah, pass that on to your organist or your band, band people, or whoever, your moko, <laughs> your moko. Uh, we covered uh, Te Triti, to Te Pauhere. Um, we've traveled with Pihopa John Black from 1840 to 1992 and his coho, his sermon, delivered on the 25th anniversary at St. Matthew's in the city. A very powerful, very powerful coho. Uh, we sat with Pihopa Calvin Wright and had a cordial with friends, their cordial, about where we were at with the Pohiri. Lovely um, interactive uh, discussion with friends. We've exchanged reflections, we've had kōrero ourselves and um, 
there to be Fakaro rather than Fakaido. Faka there is a difference. Fakaido is my virtual background, all the artwork in the back. Fakaro with two A's instead of an I are thoughts. So that's a typo on my part, but it gave me a chance to tell you about Fakaido. <laughs> so that's what we've covered uh, in this session. Uh, we come to uh, the part where I'd like to introduce our most esteemed guest. E te rangatira a ti pihopa David, piki mai, kake mai, whakatau mai rā. Ko tai mai koe ki runga i reo karanga o te atanei. Nau mai, haere mai. Mā koe. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe mō tō manā ki tanga ki a mātou i roto i te kaupapa. Taha Māori. He mihi mai oha, he mihi mahana me te aroha ki a koe. Nō reira, tēnā koe, tēnā koe, ki ora mai tātou katoa. Ati Pihopa David, thank you so much for joining us today. I won't say too much more. I'll hand it over to you to respond. Tēnā koe, he te kai whakamana. Tēnā koe mō ngā kupu reka reka ki a hau. Kia mātou, ko hū mai nei i tēnei o tēnei wānanga. Te mea tua tahi kia whakaruari atia ki te atua i runga rawa, kia mau te rongo ki runga ki te whenua, kia pai te whakaaro ki ngā tangata katoa. Kei te hari tana akau i tēnei ata mo tēnei wānanga, tēnā koe e te kaiwhakamana anō, me ngā ākonga, ngā tauira, tēnā koutou mā te atua koutou e manaki. It's uh, glory to God in the highest. Uh, it's thank you for the opportunity to Cynthia to uh, share on a subject that I love very much. Uh, you're doing me a favor by asking me to think about this topic, which is so sacred and so foundational to the story of our church and our country, which is uh, from Te Tiriti to Te Pohere, from the Treaty of Waitangi to the Anglican Constitution. Uh, so with that short acknowledgement of your loving words and the privilege I feel at being with you this morning, I'll uh, begin. Te nā koutou. Uh, you've been studying the Rāwiri, you've been studying karakia, you've been studying himine and so on, and the Paiperatapu, the Bible in Māori. And that's the place to begin with the Treaty of Waitangi. Because not everybody realizes that it was a prayer in the Bible, in the New Testament, that shaped the wording of the treaty more than anything else. It's now clear from Maori and church missionary society records that the first written gospel in full was Te Rongo Paiaruka, the Gospel according to St. Luke. There were other little bits of the New Testament floating around, but a full Gospel, Te Rongo Paiaruka, the Gospel of Luke, was the first fully written biblical book to circulate in the mid-1830s, prior to the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. And if you can imagine Karakia, using Luke's gospel, but also using Te Inoi A Te Ariki, the Lord's Prayer. In both the Lord's Prayer and in Luke's gospel, you've got this key phrase. Te rangatira tanga o te rangi, the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's central to the parables in Luke it's central to the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And as Māori chiefs and Māori iwi and hapu and whānau began to absorb their own language in written Māori in Luke and in the Lord's Prayer in Karakia, the word rangatiratanga took on a tapu meaning it had always been here, of course, for a thousand years, but it took on a tapu meaning that garnished it or enhanced it. 
And this was particularly significant because the words in Māori were first written down in Cambridge in England by a language expert who was an Anglican interviewing two chiefs who traveled to Cambridge. Now these two chiefs were very, very high born, but also noted for their oratory and their Maori turns of phrase. They were experts, if you will, in narrative and public speech. And so when they spoke Maori, it was truly te reo rangatira, that is to say, not only the language a chief would use, but a chiefly form of the language. And so they spoke and the Maori written language was created in their presence and with their approval and with their coverage, their mana. And so what you've got in written Maori, first of all recorded in the Bible and nowhere else, and in Luke's gospel and in the Lord's prayer, is the highest possible form of spoken Maori written down. It's like almost as if Shakespeare wrote the Book of Common Prayer, which actually some people think he did in parts. There is a theory, not proven, that Shakespeare is behind the Psalms in the old uh, prayer book. We don't know. But certainly whether that's true, it is true that in the Maori Bible, written Maori for the first time in biblical form, you have the highest possible form of Māori language. And if you want to introduce somebody to te reo rangatira of the highest order, get them to read the Bible in Māori. So when, after it was written down and created into a written language, of course it omitted some consonants like D or Y or X or Z or S or F, but it kept at its heart, it's Marco, R A E O U, all the vowels, because actually in Māori, it is a flowing process verb orientated language. It's designed not to be sort of clunky nouns, one thing after another, with consonants all over the place. It's meant to be poetry in motion. And that's what you have in. Te Paipure Tapu, Hiroto Te Reo Māori, you have it in Te Rawiri, you have it in Te Inoe Aotearike, you have it in Te Rongo Paiaruka. And so this is what was circulating, firstly in Luke's Gospel, in eight, the 1830s. And it was the mission participant chiefs who spread written Māori pieces of Luke and the story of Luke, often way beyond the Pākehā missions. They've done some statistical analysis and they've found that the evangelists, the catechists, the Bible proclaimers of that early period was 80% Māori, that is to say by Māori, for Māori, with Māori, from a Pākehā mission in the first place. Pai here, obviously, but there were many others um, throughout Aotearoa. But it was about 80% Māori, to 20% Pākehā transmission. So most of it was in Wānanga and Hui and Kōrero and Karakia in an utterly Māori context. And it spread eventually like wildfire because of that. And so this fascination with Māori written down for the first time, this fascination with the dignity and flow of the language from these chiefs turns of phrase, if you will, and grammar, the fascination with the sacred meaning of the Bible, which resonated so much to the highest of Māori aspirations. For example, in Luke's Gospel, you've got parables like the sower, the Good Samaritan, the Great Feast, the Prodigal Son. Now, all of those, for example, in Māori, imagine it in a utterly Māori context, utterly controlled by rangatira in a wānanga, when they hear about sowing seed generously 
and everywhere, even though some of it falls on the rocks or the birds get some of it or the sun scorches some of it or the thorns choke some of it. Māori listeners to a Māori rangatira sharing this parable from Luke's gospel immediately get into the agricultural world view of Jesus of Nazareth, immediately. It's exactly their own experience and they see it being blessed and hallowed by the parable. Uh, the great feast is even more so. A hākari in Māori is never uh, limited or nitpicking or have you got a ticket or you weren't invited, what are you doing here? It's entirely open. And that's precisely the point of the parable of the great feast in Luke's gospel. Bring everybody, bring even the people who are not expecting to be invited. In fact, go and find them and bring them, compel them as the word in the, in the Bible, bring them in. And a Maori audience hearing this in Te Reo Rangatira is thinking, uh, this is us. And furthermore, this is what Jesus of Nazareth is saying is the highest form of hākari. And so they embrace these stories intuitively and instinctively and with fascination and with love and with respect. This is not colonization. This is recognition by Māori for Māori with Māori of the Aramaic spirituality of Jesus of Nazareth. And so I'm going on at length about this because I won't go into the other parables, but the similar process goes on with the prodigal son, hoho i te rongo, uh, and so on. Uh, and when they came to the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840, the mission participant chiefs with this kind of background, and they saw an Anglican missioner whom they did trust, Henry Williams, who had helped print some of these Lucan gospels, he was called Karufa. He had a set of glasses, so he had two ordinary eyes and two spectacles. So one, two, three, four, Karufa, four eyes. Um, he said to them at Waitangi, when the treaty was translated into Māori by him, he was also an avid devotee of Te Rongo Paiaruka, Gospel according to Luke. He knew about the Māori uh, Bible. He knew and understood Māori grammar. When he said to them, what you're being offered by the British is rangatiratanga. You can imagine the resonance at that point. But they weren't completely convinced, and neither would anybody else be. You know, when you're offered something new, you want to look at the small print. And you also, especially it involves new people coming into your country and your own mana we would be the same. So they said, effectively, didn't use these words, they said, we want to think about the small print. What does rangatiratanga mean in this document? And they said, to be sure that we have agreed to something that the British must uphold. We want you, Henry, to put in another word in front of rangatiratanga. We want you to put in the word tino, true rangatiratanga, true chiefly rule, true kingdom powers. Absolute chiefly rule is another way of describing it. And so in the second article of the treaty, Henry wrote down in Māori, this is the English translation, the Queen of England agrees to protect the sub-tribes and all the people of New Zealand, that means the Māori people of New Zealand, in the unqualified tino exercise reality of their chieftainship, rangatiratanga, over their lands, villages, and all their, all their treasures which can include forestry, can include fishing, can include language, can include uh, other cultural items which are crucial to being Māori. And so it is clear from Waitangi 
1840, February the 6th, that the mission educated chiefs led the day to say, if this is what it means, we will sign. Other chiefs said, no, no, we could push the British into the sea now. And they could have, because there was only a small amount of colonial representatives, 98% Maori that day. But the mission participant chiefs said, this could be a covenant, a sacred pact. It could maybe offer partnership, participation and protection. I'm paraphrasing their whakaro, their, their kōrero. If we are under Christ, you can see how important that is from the early biblical history. If we follow Jesus of Nazareth, if we incorporate his parables into our actions together, this will work. In other words, it won't work if there's no faith, hope, and love. The thing will fall apart. They knew that then. It will fall apart. It will be betrayed. It will be shafted if there isn't faith, hope, and love. But they took a faith, hope, and love position that morning in the end. And two things were crucial to this moment. Firstly, they knew perfectly well what was at stake and what was at risk. They weren't at all naive and they weren't victims of a colonial hoodwink. They knew the French were coming down with warships. They knew the Germans were interested in parts of Oceania and the Pacific. Some of them had been to England, including the two chiefs who went to Cambridge, and they came back. They'd seen the Duke of Wellington's troops. They'd seen his cannons, and they'd heard about the Napoleonic Wars. So what they were thinking had to include the idea that we ought to put something down on paper which we can use as a moral challenge to this huge European um, movement down towards our part of the world. Write something down that we can call on as a moral challenge to their wairuatanga, to their Bible, to their highest values and beliefs. Moral leverage, if you will. That this is your Bible, we're adopting it in our way. This is your Lord, we're adopting it in our way. This is your promise, we're adopting it. And if you break it, you are breaking your own moral code. There was no naivety at the signing of the treaty. And secondly, they thought that another word in Luke's gospel, kawanatanga, had a sacred meaning as well. It's there in describing the, the governorship of Pontius Pilate. And they, they knew the Bible better than the colonial officers. And they said to themselves, kawanatanga, that is to say governance, should resemble the relationship. It is expressed in, in, in the Bible, in the New Testament, where Pontius Pilate does not interfere with the mana of Herod. Herod is a king. Herod has rung a tiratanga over some aspects of Jewish, uh, some of the Jewish territory. It's his territory. Pontius Pilate doesn't touch that. And if he did, he would have got civil war. So they saw these structural political models. They were very familiar with them, more familiar probably than, than Captain Hobson. But Henry Williams knew what it meant. So he said, what we're looking here at in our karakia from our Bible is a balance between governorship, governance, and absolute chiefly rule. But again, that won't work if it's not inspired by the author of the Bible, God, Tatua Kaharoa, and if it's not influenced by the values of Jesus of Nazareth. We know it won't work if there's no faith, hope, and love. 
but we are asking you to share this faith, hope, and love with us. And the most famous speech of all, in my view, at Waitangi that morning was from a Kaitaia chief. He was quite young. He'd just come out of a mission school. And he said to Captain Hobson, these words get me every time. If your British hearts are towards Christ, as ours are, we shall be one. So, in the initial phase of the treaty, and I'll read it to you in Māori as translated into English by Hugh Kafaru, who is an Anglican uh, from the Tamaki Makaurau area, Ngāti Whātua, I think. He said this is what it meant to the chiefs. You can probably Google on this if you want to find it later, but Article the first, the chiefs of the confederation and all the chiefs who have not joined that confederation give absolutely to the Queen of England forever the complete kawanatonga, governance structures over their land. Second, the Queen of England agrees to protect the chiefs, the sub-tribes, and all the people of New Zealand, that's the Māori, in the unqualified exercise of their rangatiratanga over their lands, villages, and all their treasures. But on the other hand, the chiefs of the Confederation and all the chiefs will sell land to the Queen at a price agreed to by the person owning it. In other words, you can't invade, you can't embezzle, you can't schnooker, you can't be disingenuous with us, and you can't outmaneuver us in land deals. And you may not take it without our permission. And only by Queen's agent will we, will we negotiate, not by an incoming colonial army, not by getting a children signature, not by going to another chief close by. Third, for this Agreed arrangement, therefore, concerning the government of the Queen, the Queen of England will protect the ordinary people of New Zealand, meaning the Māori, and will give them the same rights and duties of citizenship as the people of England. Now that means, and Hugh Kafaru has been very clear on this, Māori customary law, L-O-R-E, all the rights of citizens the same as the people of England have rights of citizenship. That means Maori citizenship in a Maori way. And that means that if Maori land owner wants to give land to a mission or to a trader, the Maori law, L-O-R-E, of that transaction must apply. And the Māori law, L-O-R-E, of a transaction in those days meant this. I will give you this amount of acreage for your mission, your orchard, your wheat mill, your school, for a consideration. Ka tuku ka hoko. I will give it to you like a grant in trust for a purpose. And this amount of money or axes or guns or cloth will be a sign of our understanding. But this does not mean a commercial sale of the 21st century kind where I completely lose my interest in this land. We will continue to share the benefit of this land together. And that kātuku kahoko was completely overridden and misunderstood and abused by the New Zealand Land Company in the decades that followed. Long story short, you know that the treaty was trampled on, it, its faith, hope and love were desecrated, it turned into a greed grab operation by the New Zealand Land Company, none of whom came here. They all stayed in London. They sent agents here and they broke the treaty. They broke the treaty. The missionaries, some of them complained. They wrote letters to the House of Lords saying, this is not what happened at Waitangi. Read the Bible. Kalenzo wrote, 
very strongly. Bishop Souter later and Nelson wrote very strongly. Octavius Hadfield wrote very strongly. This is a breach of a sacred biblical covenant. But the New Zealand Land Company and the East India Company and all of that were not interested in the Bible. They were interested in money and they wanted land. And so little by little, the loss of trust, the loss of faith, the loss of hope, the loss of love ended up in the New Zealand land wars of the 1860s, which was essentially those Māori rangatira trying to protect what land remained to them in the process of major breaches of the Treaty of Waitangi. It was a position of defense. And the Waitangi Tribunal has made it clear with all its apologies and all its restorative justice packages that Rewi Mangamaniopoto, for example, at the Battle of Oraco was not the aggressor. He was trying to protect what land remained to him in what later became called the King Country. That's only one example of hundreds, which is why the Crown is settling with the tribes now. So the Anglican Church, Te Hahi Mehinari, Tireni, King Amotari Otumano Nuyakiwa, said in the decade before 1990, under the guidance of Professor Fatarangi Winiata, but many others, particularly supported by the Pihopatanga Aotearoa, we've got to put this covenant back on the altar. We've got to get back to the promises that Henry brokered, that those Māori Christian chiefs pledged and that the crown agreed to because we have no other moral basis on which to live and trade and thrive in this country. If you break, you saw off the branch on which you're sitting, if you undermine the foundations of your whare, the branch and the house will fall morally. And I personally believe that if the treaty had not been restored through the Waitangi tribunal process and by ratification which is still going on, by the way, of various kinds, but particularly by Te Hahi Mehinari in placing the treaty right near the top of its own constitution to preach it again, to uphold it again, to live it again, to share it again for sacred reasons, prayer book reasons, Luke's gospel reasons, we would be in a very, very different scene than we currently have today. I think we would have seen um, massive, massive breakdown of all kinds all over the place. As it is, we've got people with strong attitudes, good on them. We've got people questing for restorative justice, good on them. We've got all kinds of movements to ratify the treaty again. And this, before I close with questions, is the meaning of the treaty today, but thinking of February 6, 1840, it means this, the guarantee of absolute chiefly rule, which provides for Maori self-determination, manamoto hake, in the design, delivering, and monitoring of government services. It's a balance between kawanatanga and rangatiratanga. Secondly, equity, the principle of equity, which requires the crown to commit to achieving equitable outcomes for Maori across the board. Thirdly, active protection. The principle means the Crown should act to the fullest extent practicable to achieve equitable outcomes. This includes ensuring that its agents and its treaty partner are well informed on the extent and nature of both Māori outcome, social outcomes and efforts to achieve them. Fourthly, the principle of options, which requires the Crown to provide for and properly resource Kopapa Māori services, the Crown is obliged to ensure that all services are provided in a culturally appropriate way that recognizes and supports the expression of Māori models and Māori ways of life. Lastly, partnership requires the Crown and Māori to work in partnership in the governance, design and delivery of services. Māori must be co-designers with the Crown. That's what the treaty means today, and that's what is being incrementally 
uh, probably haphazardly, but certainly implemented. And recent examples, just the last three weeks, I was there, Kiri Kiri Roa, Hamilton City Council voted for a Māori ward. That morning, the Waipaia District Council had voted for a Māori ward. Previous year, Taranaki Regional Council voted for a Māori ward. Tauranga City Council, after huge debate and dissension, voted for a Māori ward by a narrow margin. And that's the treaty in, in action. And what the Anglican Church has tried to do since 1990 and 92, when we passed Te Pohere, with the treaty right in the middle of it, was to live, to walk and talk. The values and promises, the faith, the hope and love of the treaty that we preached and brokered and commended in 1840. And I say we deliberately, um, we were there with Henry. We were there with the mission participant chiefs. We were there with Luke's gospel. We were there with the Lord's prayer. We were there with Rangatira Tonga and Kawana Tonga. And that's why we need to be in the middle of the treaty today. The Anglican church can show and tell what Tikanga caucusing could really look like. The Anglican Church can show and tell what restorative justice could look like. We're currently negotiating massive restorative justice packages in Maniapoto and Tauranga for that very reason. I'm involved in both of those. Uh, and the return of Taonga from England, Rewi Manga Maniapoto is always coming home in October because we managed to find it in an Anglican cupboard where it had been forgotten for 120 years. We, um, Tauranga Moana loss of 1,330 acres. Mission land just forced out of the hands of the missionaries. We're negotiating with the Crown to provide a package to restore a measure of what was lost, according to the iwi concerned. Breaches of Katuku Kahoko. And so that's probably enough. I could talk for another day, but um, I'll stop. And that's given you, I hope, the heart of the matter. And um, I have a little quote to end with, but I'll do that after the, if there are any questions. Yeah, I've got a couple, but I'm not going to start. I'm going to invite the participants here to, uh, if you have a question to proffer Ati Pihupa David, please do so. Bishop, um, Individual priests, certainly, like the group that's here, uh, we're all sort of doing what we can locally for helping people understand within our own parishes, communities, the importance of the work that's being done now for restitution. Why, given what you just told us of the things that the Anglican Church is actually involved in as far as restorative justice is concerned. Why is that voice not louder? Why oh. are our Anglican leaders or the people involved in this not the ones that are saying things like the, the Maori health? Yes that's being set up, why are we not loudly, more loudly, more openly and more assertively saying this is what we should do? Our voice is not being heard. Thank you. That's very, very close to home question because uh, that's what my wife has been doing for the last two years. Um, uh, that is to say, as an Anglican lay person, uh, that is to say, as a, Maori health provider, getting the Maori health authority in place. Uh, and so your question is a church voice or a church awareness or church advocacy visibly, audibly uh, there. And so my first answer to the question is we are there, but we're like salt uh, or leaven. We're not visible. Uh, and that's part of your point. There are a lot of Anglicans involved. Uh, but it, it is within the leaven or salt within the food. Uh, but I do think that the Māori Health Authority, for example, to take that example, is certainly uh, supported by the bishops, but we haven't yet seen 
uh, perhaps a statement that we could see uh, that puts that on the balcony for the church. And I think that's a good question. Um, I would say that the bishops are 100% behind it, that they are there as prayer support. They are certainly there in supporting people who do it. But it does raise the question of how we uh, institutionally express ourselves. And uh, your question this morning makes me think I should talk that through a bit more with uh, friends of mine who are in the House of Bishops. Thank you. Uh, it's quite difficult when you're operating within a parish environment to try to promote the mm. things that are happening if there's a dead silence, apparently, from our leaders. Uh, uh, convincing a, a lot of Pākehā um, Anglicans that this really is a big deal is challenging when you're the sole priest around the place who's actually talking about it. Yes, and, uh, in its early phase, the constitution Te Pohere, witnessing to the treaty, was supported by five years of full-time, five bicultural educators all over the church. But that's a long time ago. And uh, it certainly did uh, help the Pohere Tiriti witness come through across the church then. That was, I remember that very clearly in the 1980s and 90s, but that's a long time ago. So I, I think that um, uh, your question perhaps could be a good question for the Justice Commission of the General Synod, for example, who have educational capacity, who have political advocacy capacity. So you've made, you've made me think that I, I will find out. And there may be things that are being done we're not aware of, but your point is, can we be made aware of them? So I'll, I'll look into that. Nyamihi. Yoda. Anyone else? Um, not that I'm trying to bring the cannons or the pohere out, but, um, yeah. but uh, I think uh, some of the things that have come up in, in, in the season um, this year, 2021, is we ran the series Land of the Long White Cloud, which you're possibly familiar with. Um, Joe Randerson was a part of their production, um, Rethinking uh, Captain Cook. And uh, during that time, we talked about the uh, standing resolutions on bicultural partnership. So we, we were forever bringing it back into our hahi uh, context and the inclusion of Māori language and culture, you know, in ordination and training programs and um, standing resolution uh, BP1. And also, you know, the um, uh, Māori supporting Pākehā in, um, and this is just language, this is not dealing with te tiriti necessarily or land issues or anything like that. Uh, and also, you know, reflecting back on your delivery in 2011 down in Kauranga around Māori Pākehā um, relationships from your personal point of view. Um, is do you do you feel that there's a uh, you know we've come a long way looking at the people in these little squares on our TV uh, on our screens? Do you think we've come a long way in Tehahi Mihinare in in not just the language but many other things? I believe we've come a long the way. Um, that is to say, the way is a long journey along Hikwe, and we're on it, uh, we're moving, uh, but it's a long journey. So I would say, yes, um, going back to the Tauranga case, um, it was the Archbishops, it was Archbishop Philip uh, acting for Archbishop Brown today as well at the time, who initiated the restorative justice program in Tauranga, and that has been, of course, very public. Um, there are examples of... I can see um, that you're gazing out the window. <laughs> uh, so that's one example where we have made progress. We've made progress in terms of 
restorative justice over the return of land in some places or the return of Potato to Ferro Ferro's flag. Bishop mm -hmm. of Auckland did that at Turanga Waiwai. Um, there are examples where churches have been returned here at Topuri, for example. <laughs> And there are examples of churches that have been um, shared trusteeship or partnership deals, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, we're on the verge of doing things in the Waikato about church land. Uh, the worst breach of the treaty, or I should say one of the worst, was the atrocity at Rangiofia when yes. General Cameron unexpectedly invaded the peaceful Anglican mission farms of Rangiofia, uh, instead of fighting on the agreed battleground. And um, a lot of people died in the flames. And so we're currently working on what restorative justice looks like there. Uh, it's a very complicated, painful journey, but we're in the room and we're praying for justice and righteousness to prevail. Uh, I think there are other examples uh, um, in the South Island, for example, in the Diocese of Nelson, a large, uh, I think it was called Whakarewa estate, was returned. And the bishops are currently looking at the way the St. John's Trust can grow itself on a more equitable partnership basis by a positive proactive investment into the future, which is um, towards the equity of the treaty. Um, and the bishops, I think, are uh, probably uh, doing the homework or the underground work that will eventually result in things appearing on the surface. Um, having said that, the report, He Waka Eke Noa, The Way Forward, just agreed to by the Standing Committee of General Synod last week, has a devastating analysis of the difference between Māori church funding and Tikonga Pākehā diocesan church assets. It's about 3% of the Pākehā assets in the Māori church and so that's a major challenge which everyone's talking about at the moment in the standing committee and in the house of bishops it'll it will get to the diocese when that report comes to their synods and the question immediately comes um has the treaty been worked out within the church enough in terms of resource sharing and when that gets to your synod um it will it will show this massive disparity, which begs the question, what would Jesus do? Yeah. And what would Jesus do? Uh, in Luke's gospel, he would share it. Acts chapter 4, they held all things in common. So that, I think, will be an exciting opportunity for us to act restoratively within, our, within the household of faith itself. Thank you, Pihopa. Any other questions? There was a plethora of wisdom in there and unpacking some of the history, Pihopa. I particularly love the kātuku kāhoko, mm -hmm. you know, uh, expression, uh, that expression of reciprocity, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the meaning, of course, and it's been debated, I know, and perhaps some of the participants have been part of those debates. Uh, and, of course, uh, as Gillian uh, talked about, we, we're very interested in the grassroots level, you know, what's happening at the grassroots level in the local shared ministry, uh, how, how are we benefiting from that um, wonderful partnership that you expressed uh, in your bicultural partnership with Auntie Pihopa Brown today. Yeah. It's also about the uh, wonderful bicultural relationship at the grassroots level as well. Um, and I think you've already expressed that yeah, the bishops are talking about it. Gillian's expressing about how do we get it into the grassroots level when she's looking out at her um, uh, mainly Pākehā congregation and getting them interested. I think that's a, that's yeah. a big challenge. I think perhaps I, I, it's just occurred to me too that I have 
been asked recently to write an educational module, which will come to the licensed lay ministry and local shared ministry and Minitaiui and clergy uh, next year. And that module is on restorative justice by the church in Ngati Maniapoto. And all of the things that I've said this morning will be in there. So um, that is one module that will hopefully uh, begin to answer Julian's question. Uh, oh, so I've been commissioned to, to write that. And the commission money is from the social justice budget, I think, of the General Synod. And I'm giving it to um, the Ngati Maniapoto Kaitaka Coral Wai yes. return. Yes. Yes. And we'll just plagiarize it. <laughs> and, and not, but I think. I think it's it is meant to be plagiarized. So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, wonderful. And uh, no one, no, if no one else has a question, we'll move on. I'll give you a few seconds. Um, kia ora tato, uh, kia ora e te yeah. um, That was an awesome presentation. Thank you, and I'm delighted to hear that it um, will become available uh, in print in some way. Um, because it's a story I, I haven't heard so well expressed um, before. And those brilliant links that you've made uh, between the use of the words Tino and um, Kawana Tanga um, from the um, Mihinari church perspective, uh, I think it, it, it really, really well done. And I'm very appreciative. And I look forward to sharing it um, with Anglican congregations. <laughs> Thank you. Kia ora. Yeah. Perhaps I could close with a quote from Rangi Ophir. Would that be appropriate? Yeah, kia ora. Uh, this will be in the module, uh, but it's one of the most moving descriptions I've ever heard of a treaty-based hope from a Christian about the tragedy at Rangiofia, a crucifixion, which has within it the seeds of resurrection and the faith, hope, and love of an Easter people. So I'll read, read it to you. One, from one of the survivor descendants, one of the survivors of the people who died in the attack. We look forward to a day where we can again live fully in a harmonious, thriving partnership as we once did. All flowers encouraged to blossom as did the lanes of houses and children of the mission at Rangiofia. All branches of the peach trees that once lined the ridges, branches connected to a common trunk that is partnership. And should a gust of wind approach, we will stay bound and committed to growth and to tomorrow. Got it. Uh -huh. Oh, you make me all <laughs> very emotional. Mm. That is really powerful. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. To stay with us, I will give you a mihi Good towards up. the end. Uh, we, we've almost concluded. And thank you, everyone, Good for uh, participating. And the, um, we're, we're into filling our keti. It's always been the um, kaupapa of Taha Māori is to fill the keti and take it out. Uh, and uh, the other thing I really liked was that, you know, that hakari concept of uh, you don't need an invitation, you don't need to read, just so you just come to the hakari. Wow. Wonderful. And we just hope that we've got enough kai. <laughs> no, but it was in the hand. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Just a sec. I'll just share the screen again. Uh, just 
uh, again, just reverting back to our recapping, of course, I uh, just want to say that the Apostles' Creed or Te Whakapono Anga Pōtoro has, uh, I've recorded it, if you remember last week, I kept running out of breath, it's normally done with a roku, with a congregation, and uh, I didn't do it very well. So um, I've recorded it now in a presentable fashion, and again, we'll send that out to you to uh, learn, to pick up and learn. So uh, that's another resource for you. And uh, we'll continue now with Gillian. Ho hiri hiri, ho rarama, ho e te whakaro, ho e te tangata, ho u te aroha, ho e herede i a tato, maore ora ki a tato, ho me e hui e, Take it, eh? Karakia, Aka Mutunga, Eteatua, or Te Moana Nui Akiwa, Me Ene Moto, O Te Iwi Māori, Te Iwi Pakeha, Me Te Rato, Katoa, O Noho Ne Itene Wahi. Ka whakamoimiti, ka whakawhetai, ki a mō koe koe, mō tēnei whenua a mātou, mō nā mea pai katoa kua fifi tahine mātou. Whakanuia tu, tō mātou, aroha te tahi ki te tahi. Whaka ka hangea te mātou fa Fai i te tika. Kia kotahi a mato i runga i te whakaro kotahi. Kua hanga mato e koe hei toto kotahi i raro i tene whakaro kotahi. Amen. Kia tau, kia tato katoa, te atawhai o tō tato ariki a ihu karaiti. Me te aroha o te atua. Me te whiwhi ngā takitanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, ake, ake. Āmene. Āmene. E te whānau a te karaiti. E mihi ana ki a koutou, ngā tāngata e hia hia ana ki te ako. Mā tātou katoa e naki te pura pura i ruia nei e tō tātou kaumātua kuia. Kore hoki e oti i te tangata kotahi te mahi. Engari me ohu te mahi kā oti ai. Koe anei tā onamata tū whakaru. Tāne he wahine te iti te rahi rā nei me pā katoa i te mahi. Taha Māori. So, Fano of Christ, salutations to you all who have the desire to learn. We all will cultivate the seeds sown by our elders, not by one person alone, but the work should be done as a working ropu, like the rako, like the tree that Ati Pihopa spoke of just a moment ago, so that it is completed. That was the attitude in former times. Men, women, the lowly, and the important people too. They should all participate in the task. Taha Māori. Ka karanga nei au ki ngā tāngata Māori katoa e ngā kou tikana, e ngā kou pono ana, kia maia, kia kaha. Kia u ki te mea tika. Kaua e utua te kino ki te kino e ngari Manakitia, ngā hunga e tu kino ana i a koe. Ko rero mai nei i a koutou te mārama, tō haina ki te ao. E ngā mea tino nui e matia ana e ngā tāngata katoa. Ko te ora roa, ko te hari, ko te tumanako me te aroha. I call upon all people. Who are true and faithful, be courageous, be strong. 
Hold fast to what is right. Do not pay evil for evil, but bless those who do wrong by you. You have received the light. Now give it to the world. The greatest things needed by all people is a long life, happiness, hope, and love. Again, we give thanks to Ati Pihopa David for giving of his time, sharing his knowledge and that mountain of history and the influence that he still is able to participate within the conversations and development and creation of tools for our kete, for our ministry kete, for our bicultural relationships. I te Ati Pihopa, tēnā rā koe. Tēnā koe, e te kaiwhakamana. Kia tau mai anō, kia koutou tātou katoa, ngā manāki tanga a te atua kaharawa, a te matua te tama, me te wairua tapu. Amen. Kia ora mai tātou, kia ora mai tātou. We'll be in touch, let you know what, what the next round uh, will entail. And thank you for taking part. You can, of course, stay on if you wish. <laughs> <laughs>